Uh, I want to uh, thank you all for having me back out, and especially thank Melanie. I think we've been planning this since last uh, National Library Week, yes. and uh, I am pleased to be out here with you on National Library Week. Something that occurred to me this morning, uh, and, and when I worked for the uh, State Library, I was a traveling consultant. Uh, is anyone familiar with deja vu? That, that feeling like this, we've done this before? <clears throat> because um, way back in 2001, in September, I was here in Colby at this library after 9 11. And now here I am back again. I was watching the news before we came over, and it was just like, oh, wow. As, as long as I don't bring that trouble to Colby, we're all good, right? <laughs> and keep the snow away for just a little bit longer until I get back home. Okay, thanks again for having me. I wanted to uh, uh, let you know I'm here as part of the Kansas Humanities Council Speakers Bureau. This season they uh, are hosting a statewide traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian called the Way We Worked. And as part of that exhibit, they have brought uh, the Speakers Bureau to communities all across the state on topics about working. Uh, and uh, they, uh, when they asked me about it, I said I would uh, like to do one about um, the work ethic of Dwight Eisenhower. Now this was things that I had learned during the process of writing a children's book about I. It's called Little I. Um, and I found there, there's a wealth of information, but we don't see it. Many of us have uh, uh, read about I, we've heard about I. Most of the information that we have uh, says that Dwight Eisenhower grew up in Abilene, Kansas. And then it talks about him being a general, him being the uh, commander of the uh, uh, Allied forces in Europe, him becoming the uh, head of NATO, the first head of NATO, him becoming the uh, president of the United States, on and on. There is this huge gap. And what I set out to do was to fill a gap because I'd been asked to write a book about, uh, well, I was asked to write children's nonfiction by a publisher. And I'd actually done several books for that publisher. Uh, they asked me, have you ever thought about doing children's nonfiction? Uh, I, I hadn't, but I thought well, this would be a unique opportunity. I'd always wanted to do something with Eisenhower, but there's a lot of children's books out there about Eisenhower. You can probably find a dozen or so upstairs in the collection. All of which say he grew up in Abilene, and then move on to him being a general or him being president or something. Um, only one biography came very close to talking about what it was like growing up in Apple. And I thought, well, this is something that children today might benefit from. So I started looking into that. And the result was Little Ike. This one is called Little Ike. And this title was a no brainer it, it wasn't something that I came up with. Or it's not original. Lived by literally. When Dwight was growing up, the nickname Ike had already been given to his older brother, Edgar. But people started calling Dwight Ike. Too. It was actually a pretty common nickname in the 19th century. Edgar became Big Ike. Dwight became Little Ike. Little Ike. And, and a lot of 
folks go to that and they think, oh, you're just doing that because you're talking about his boyhood. Yeah, that's true, but literally that's what he was called. They lived in Texas for a couple years and uh, they weren't getting hit there either. Um, actually, as I look at it, only one really valuable thing came from their trip to Texas. Uh, Ida learned to make a local uh, favorite in the kitchen, hot tamales. Now, hot tamales doesn't sound real flashy here, but trust me, when they moved back to Kansas among those, uh, those uh, uh, Quakers, Mennonites, Amish, hot tamales was exotic. And this lady that knew how to make them, they, the boys would take advantage of this. Um, but they still weren't getting ahead, so uh, David moved to uh, back to Abilene when a new job opened up there. And that new job was at the Bell Springs Creamery. Now, I mentioned creameries and what they did in little small towns. Bell Springs expanded that. It was one that did this for a larger area. It, the little towns would uh, gather the produce, the milk, the eggs, the butter, that kind of thing. It would be shipped by rail. They actually called some of those milk <coughs> trains to Bell Springs Creamery where it went. And, and uh, if you go down and see uh, what's left of the creamery now in Abilene, which is just um, just north of the Eisenhower Center, um, it's right along the railroad. They would move things right across from the creamery to the rail cars to be shipped east. Most of those went to Topeka, but some went on down to Kansas City. Uh, there were a number of those regional places around, but Bell Springs also had uh, some steam engines because they started doing some things that uh, could add to their, to their uh, income there as a business. They started making ice because ladies were getting this new piece of furniture in their kitchens, big wooden box with that, you know, four or six doors on it. It's called an ice box. And ice blocks were put in the ice box. And as they melted, they would keep things cold. So they started producing blocks of ice. Prior to that, if you were in ice in Abilene or any place else in Kansas, you uh, went out to the nearest stream during the winter, you hoped it got cold, um, and you would cut ice, and you would haul it in and put it in an ice house and pack it with sawdust or straw and hope that there would be enough left about the 4th of July to, be, uh, to uh, cool your lemonade and to make ice cream. But Bell Springs went a little bit beyond that. They started making commercial ice cream. They also began delivering dairy products to the local stores, or you could buy it directly from the creamery. So they had a lot of things going on. They had several steam engines, and David Eisenhower took the job to be in charge of those. He was the Bell Springs engineer. And nothing to do with trains. He was an engineer for the steam engines that made that possible. They were hardworking people. They, they all worked hard, and so were the boys. They had to be. They'd, learned, they'd grown up with that work ethic. They applied that work ethic, and they passed it on to the boys. So they, whenever they uh, were old enough, the boys took on chores. They all had chores because I couldn't do it all. And quite literally, David was doing 12-hour days most days. He would work every day but Sunday. And then it was on call because there was always a steam engine that had to be running or one of those freezers is going to shut down. So uh, he was, he was uh, always working hard. I was always working hard. The boys started finding jobs in addition to their chores whenever they could because after all they were still boys. Um, and uh, I himself was very much into sports. 
So he had all these things that he needed to do as, as, uh, as a sportsman. He liked to play games like baseball or football, but in order to play baseball, you had to have a bit, you had to have a bat, you had to have a ball, and those things weren't cheap. And they weren't ball gloves either. With those technologically advanced things we see being used today, they were really mitts. You remember those? You put your hand in it, and then you tried to make it close around the ball. <clears throat> Basically, it was just to keep the burn away when it landed in your hand. But you had to buy those. You had, they had uh, uh, later on, he was in high school, if they, they were in uh, baseball clubs or football clubs, and you had to uh, buy uniforms, hats. Uh, if you're playing football, you had to have a football. They didn't have uh, pants, all, this, all the paraphernalia that football players wear today, but they did have leather helmets. They looked like World War I fighter pilots, you know, when they put them on. Um, all that cost money. Uh, White also liked to fish and hunt, so he had to buy fishing tackle, ammunition for a single shot rifle, all that stuff. So uh, Ida and David always made sure that they had opportunities to make money for themselves. They didn't have an allowance, but they had money, opportunities to make money for themselves. One of the first jobs that I had was to uh, do it with paper. He didn't have a paper route. But his uncle, who was a self-taught veterinarian, would uh, pay him a penny a day to go out and bring the Abilene newspaper back to Uncle Lakes. Uh, penny a day. That's when he started. He was about five when he was doing that. Um, by the way, at the same time, in Abilene, in the early 1900s now, uh, they built a new high school, one that Dwight would attend. They built a new Carnegie Library, one that I would use. Uh, so the town was growing and changing during that time when he was there. It was the time, it wasn't the Cowtown age. It wasn't the days uh, during the war. So, you know, a lot of people kind of overlooked that. But it was a great time for a young boy to be growing up in small town Kansas. Um, Another job that I had, every one of the boys had an opportunity to have part of a family garden plot. Again, when they moved to Abilene, they got a very large lot, and now they could grow their own vegetables, and the boys sold them door to door. Most of the Eisenhower boys did this. Uh, I specialized and grew mainly sweet corn and cucumbers. And I got this from his, uh, his autobiography. Uh, he grew sweet corn because everyone wanted to grow sweet corn, but you had to have a lot of space and a lot of water to do that. So not everybody who were neighbors had that luxury, and he would sell sweet corn door to door. His mother gave him a little pack, and she would carry, and he would carry that little pack with sweet corn door to door. You could get a dozen ears for a quarter. And cucumbers, because at that time, most of the ladies in Abilene did their own pickling, especially on the south side of the tracks where I grew up. Uh, so he was selling cucumbers to make sure the ladies had enough to pickle. Again, a dozen cucumbers for a quarter. And I himself said he never, he never haggled. There was no business involved here. If he didn't have a quarter or weren't willing to cough it up, he just filled his pack and went on down to the next house. He had a little route and he, uh, he sold vegetables that way. Now, what do you do when you can't, you know, you can only do that during the growing season, right? So what do you, what do you sell when you uh, aren't growing cucumbers or sweet corn? He sold hot tamales. I, I had started making them, and the boys would sell them door to door. Eventually, she was um, she taught the boys how to make them. And as a matter of fact, I became uh, developed a reputation as quite a cook. Uh, he also learned from his mother how to make apple pies, and they were 
Uh, he sometimes sold those. More often, he made them for the family or for uh, uh, special events, church socials, and things like that. But he had that reputation. He, uh, but he always also knew that he, education was important. So he worked very hard with his education as well. Um, his early uh, grade school records were they were hard to find. But by high school, we know that he uh, he got A's and B's mostly as a freshman in high school in that new high school building. Uh, he got. Uh, mostly A's and a few B's as a sophomore. Junior year, senior year, all A's, both years. Another thing about his high school uh, time was um, the boys had all had to work. And uh, while Edgar was in high school, he dropped out of school at one point because he got a job. And uh, David, was a very strong believer in education. He certainly wanted his boys to know how to work, but he wanted them to get their education as well. He was extremely angry. As a matter of fact, uh, I, Dwight said his father was more furious than he'd ever seen him before when he found out that Edgar had dropped out of school and actually went to the shed and brought back a piece of leather harness strap to deliver a beating for Edgar dropping out of school, and I, only I stopped him. And I was a little guy, he was the younger. And he, he, he prevented his father from beating Edgar any further. Um, Edgar did stay out, he did work for two years. When he finally returned to school, he was in Ike's class. So, Big Ike and Little Ike graduated the same year. I, and, and I honestly have not looked much beyond Abilene, but it seemed like in uh, Abilene, among youngsters, they talked a lot about becoming president of the United States. Uh, there's a story uh, that's told, and I got this directly from the Eisenhower Center. The, uh, uh, there was a friend of Little Ike's. The two boys were out fishing, and I I can picture them on the banks down at the Smoky Hill or Mud Creek or Turkey Creek fishing. And, um, it, you know, as, as it is when you're out there dangling your line, grabbing worms, one of the uh, friends said, when I grow up, I want to be president of the United States, just like Teddy Roosevelt. And I said, when I grow up, I want to be a professional baseball player, just like Honus Wagner. <coughs> I'll let you go upstairs and look that one out. <laughs> now, Honus Swagner was a, uh, one of the first professional baseball players who got paid $1,200 a year just to play baseball. Of course, he had to go out and find other work in between games, but uh, he did get paid to play baseball. And that was what I hoped to do. Now, when they got to be seniors, both Big Ike and Little Ike are in the uh, Abilene High School yearbook. And uh, the yearbook always predicted what, what their future was going to hold for every student. And the high school wasn't that big. So. Under Edgar's picture, it says that he will be president of the United States. And under Dwight's picture, he will just be a Yale history professor. <laughs> um, as it turned out, right after they graduated, Edgar enrolled and went to the University of Michigan to get an education. Uh, he never gave it up. Even though he dropped out of school for a while, he had never given up on that goal. Um, and Dwight went out and worked. He spent most of his time working for the Bell Springs Creamery. And there, one of his jobs was to deliver advice. But uh, he would also pick up any other jobs that he could, including being a baseball umpire. Uh, there were some semi-pro teams, and people who were still playing baseball after they got out of high school, and they would hire an umpire for like a dollar a game. And Dwight would go. He traveled up and down the railroad. Uh, 
places, exotic places like Junction City, to uh, admire baseball games between the Abilene Club and the Junction City Club. Uh, so he was picking up odd jobs whenever he had the opportunity. Some of his money went into his own accounts. Some of it was sent to help Edgar pay his way through school. And the sort of tacit agreement was that I would help Edgar in his college education, and then Edgar would turn around and help I. When we start to do the math, that means I could not really be getting his life started until he was well into his 20s. <clears throat> and he really didn't want to wait that long. An acquaintance of his told him how he was applying to one of the Kansas senators to uh, a military academy, actually to the uh, Naval Academy at Annapolis. Um, at that time, each senator, all, all the senators in the Senate, in the Senate, could appoint two people to each military academy. There were two, uh, there were only two academies, one in Annapolis and one in West Point. But that sounded really good to I because number one, um, it was a free education. He wouldn't have to work while he was studying. Number two, got a guaranteed a job. Because when you got out, you were automatically in the military. You were either in the Navy or in the Army. And thirdly, he applied to the Navy because what could be more exotic to a kid from Kansas than wearing a nifty white uniform and sailing on? I remember that he was growing up when uh, Teddy Roosevelt had sent our great white fleet around the world. Wow, can you imagine wearing those white clothes on a white boat? Going to places in Europe and Africa and South America, Asia, oh my gosh, can you imagine? What, what is that like to a Kansas kid? Actually, talk to some Navy people and uh, you're, you're liable to find out this. This tendency continued clear up through the end of World War II. Um, anyway, I applied. He applied to a U.S. Senator and he heard about it a little bit too late. The senator said, um, by the way, they had to go down to Topeka and take some tests before they could even begin to be considered. Well, I could score really well on the tests, but all the appointments had been made by both of the senators. So he was out of luck that year. He was kind of dejected as he got ready to head back to Abilene. Once there in Abilene, he got a letter from one of the senator's offices. It said, uh, Dear Mr. Eisenhower, one of the appointees cannot fulfill his obligation this year. It is not to Annapolis, it is to West Point. Would you be interested? Would he? <laughs> By September, 1911, 100 years to the month before Little Light was published, um, Dwight got on a train in Abilene and headed east by himself, went all the way to West Point as a young 20 year old. Well, actually, he would turn 20 once he got back to West Point. All the way back to West Point, New York, by himself. He's never been much further than Junction City. <coughs> Topeka. This was quite a trip. <coughs> Ultimately, he did go on to become general of the army. He did go on to become the commander in chief of all allied forces in Europe. He did go on to become the first NATO commander, president of Columbia <coughs> University, and eventually president of the United States. And when he retired, and 1961, he didn't come back to Kansas. He went back and lived near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which was about 20 miles from where his grandparents had left to come to Kansas in the first place. And 
and one last story because Dwight always had a reputation as a uh, uh, very neat, well-organized person. And one of the reasons that he became the commander in North Africa, became the commander in Europe, was because of his organizational skills. It took, it didn't take a lot of strategy, it took a lot of organization to get armies together, to put ships at sea, to carry armies through the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic, you know, to, to put airplanes in the sky. It took a lot of organization. And that was, that became one of Ike's, you know, his, his reputation of being well organized. And he also had a reputation Every time people saw him first thing in the morning in his office, his desk was completely clear. Now there was a gentleman who was a journalist at this time. He was also from Abilene. And his name was John Bird, no relation to this bird. John Bird had grown up about the same time as I, and he was writing for um, two major magazines during World War II. One was the Saturday Evening Post, the other was Reader's Digest. And maybe I did have a fondness for his hometown. Maybe it was because of that that uh, uh, John Bird was in his office late one day in the Oval Office and mentioned that to Ike and asked him how he did that. Because apparently the desk was certainly not neat and the day was coming to a close. So Ike said, stick around and I'll show you how. And he opened the lap drawer on the desk Shovel everything into it, close the drawer, put out one legal pad and three sharpened pencils. Whoever walked in the next morning, that was what they saw. That's Ike's work ethic. Uh, I know some of you uh, have to get back to, uh, to other duties, but uh, I appreciate you all being here. It's a great turnout. Uh, Melanie was talking to me, and uh, I think I agree with her. What she needs here to call me is a bigger meeting room for things like this. Bless you all for coming, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to stand for those and share what I know.
I started, I, I heard about Eisenhower all the time I was growing up. Uh, I, I wanted to do something, but there, there were all many, already so many biographies, and they didn't really jive with what I was hearing about I. And ultimately, when my publisher said, have you ever thought about doing children's nonfiction, I started kicking some ideas around, and the first one was, what was it like for Eisenhower to grow up in Kansas? Sir, what was the process for making ice before when it wasn't freezing in the river? The process before the steam engines? Well, what was the process when the steam engines? I don't understand how you fix steam. Well, it's just like any other uh, uh, today. We need electricity to run a freezer. Well, somewhere, unless you have a wind generator farm nearby, you're probably getting steam power electricity. Those are coal fired. We're using coal to fire the steam engines. And, and um, I would not be a bit surprised, and maybe there's some, some of you that know, did coal be ever have its own electric plant? Oh, yeah. Yes, we do. We do now. Okay. How, how, how does electricity get produced? Well, somebody holds coal in, probably from Wyoming, right? Diesel fuel. Diesel? I think that, don't they buy a lot of their stuff? Yeah, they probably do that as well. But uh, at one time, many, many, many towns had their own electrical plants. And those were coal fired plants, which basically are steam engines. <coughs> and the, the, the steam turns the turbines, to the generators, to produce the electricity. And the same thing was working uh, as they developed uh, those things. And by the way, steam engines were doing that. They were running uh, uh, sawmills. One of my uh, one of my great aunts. Mary Fellow eventually bought or was another partner in that lumber yard in Hope. Uh, one, of, one of her brothers worked in a lumber yard in Abilene and lost uh, three finger, two fingers and a thumb off of his right hand uh, in, in one of those steam powered saws and taught himself to write with just these two fingers and had the easiest handwriting in the whole family. Uh, so the, the uh, and, and, and even uh, today, if you uh, uh, swing by Lindsborg, you can see a steam-powered roller mill where they uh, make flour, they make stock feed, they make uh, all kinds of uh, grain and meal. Been doing that for years and years. So uh, steam engines, and, and, and they're still around. Uh, we just uh, we kind of see those as that was old stuff. And now we've got different stuff, which is going to really soon be old stuff, too. Did that help? Thank you. Other questions? Well, when I talk French McConnell, I always round up my class with uh, another one. Are there any answers? <laughs> if not, thank you all again for having us.